reason we should be short for you. But uh, yeah, we've just been pinging out a few um, uh, basically sort of webinars on, on a Monday, and by Wednesday we're getting uh, you know, 100, 800 to 1,000 people sign up. So thank you very much for uh, for joining us. And I, I really hope they're, they're valuable. And if you have any um, ideas for topics that we should run webinars on, do shout because we love to discuss various things and research various things, as you probably know. So if you have any ideas for topics, do just mail me. I'm just steve at buzzsumo.com, so just mail me, and we'll try and cover those uh, in future sessions. Okay, I think we're um, we're almost at the uh, the top of the hour now. So welcome uh, everybody. Thank you very much for for joining uh, our webinar this afternoon, which is all about uh, how to create engaging data driven stories. So it's something if you but we're really keen on data, and we're really keen on trying to find stories with inside that data, the insights that uh, are useful to all of us, really. So that's very much what we try to do. Um, I'm joined this afternoon, really pleased to be joined this afternoon by Alexandra Tachilova. I don't know, Alexandra, if you want to say hello now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm really excited about uh, um, our upcoming session. Thank you, Steve, for a warm introduction. Um, we also uh, have a hashtag, uh, you can see it on the screen there, just data stories. Um, do feel free to tweet, um, you know, share your thoughts. It's, it's wonderful that we can sort of take things away from webinars, but it's even better when we all contribute and we all add value. And uh, none of us have a monopoly on good ideas. There are lots of good ideas out there, and they're, they're certainly not all ours. So uh, it'd be great to hear your ideas as well as we go. So what is it about data-driven stories? Well, the interesting thing is that um, I've noticed this a lot recently, but I've just picked up two examples of people who talk about data-driven stories Storytelling is, is you know, the next big trend in content marketing. Uh, there's a quote there from Harvard, uh, Adweek saying how it's going to rapidly reshape content and advertising. Um, and I think it's for a number of reasons. I think it's partly because there's just a lot more data out there now. You know, all of us can collect data. We probably have data in our businesses which we don't even realize which could be valuable for people. And there are also lots of great tools to analyze data these days from whether it's just simply analyzing and putting things in word clouds, doing correlations. There are lots of great tools and we'll cover some of those this afternoon uh, in the session from Alex. So there's more data, there are tools to analyze the data, but I think um, one of the really reasons for me is sort of why data-driven stories work so well is that they tend to be quite engaging because they tend to show you something that's happening with the data. By their very nature, they tend to lend themselves to quite impactful visuals. So I've got a couple of charts here, but you can have really nice sort of impactful visuals, whether it's a pie chart or a trend, etc. I think the other interesting thing about data-driven stories is they tend to be an evergreen resource because they're based on data. They become referenceable. People can go back and reference that content. So if it's based on data or research, it's referenceable. And there's quite a lot of evidence, I believe now, that research-backed stories, data-backed stories, actually attract higher links than other forms of content. Um, and I know a few people have asked me about this and uh, sometimes challenged me about it. Um, so I wanted to show a few examples of that. So um, the first one is just from my own work. This is a blog post that I wrote for Moz at the end of last year. It was about analyzing a million articles and seeing whether there's a relationship between shares and links. You can see the shares were okay. I mean, for, for Moz, it was in this sort of upper quartile of their shares, and only 6,000 shares, but it really outperformed when it came to links. So these are linking domains, not... So linking domains is, is the number of domains that link to you. You can have lots more links, but you might get three or four from one domain. So this is the number of different domains that link to the article. And you can see 553, that's quite a lot of links for a single article. And so you could say, well, that's, that's just a one-off, Steve, but um, actually I can see this again and again. So um, this is probably hard to see on your screen, and apologies for that, but this is the most shared content from Social Media Examiner. Uh, in the last six months. But if I highlight one of those, the middle one there, it's they do an annual report. So it's based on data, it's based on surveys, and they do this industry report. And we can see that actually in terms of shares, it wasn't up there with the, the top two, which are seven and 8,000 shares. Um, but if we look at the number of links, it had 531 referring linking domains. I should say for those of you seeing this and saying, oh, I don't see that on my Buzzsumo. This is something we're adding into the, the platform at the moment. It's currently being tested in beta. So we see total shares on the right, and then next to it on the left, we see the total number of referring uh, linking domains. So we can see there for Social Media Examiner, the industry report based on data 
got a lot more links. And just to show you that wasn't a one-off, here are some of the most shared articles on Content Marketing Institute. In the middle here, we have this one by Joe Paluzzi on new research. And that new research one, again, has got a lot of uh, linking domains. Again, it happens to be in the 500s again, but significantly higher than any of the others. I mean, they get good links to other articles, but but research back posts seem to get more. And when we looked at millions of posts, we found this quite consistently that basically referenceable content tends to get more links. It tends to be slightly more evergreen. Um, so that's important for all of us when it comes to our SEO. So that's one of the reasons, obviously, we're all interested in data back stories. So, okay, if you're going to write a data back story, and I write quite a lot of these, I think there are five core narratives you could look at. So five story types you can look to tell when you're writing a post uh, using data. And they're fairly straightforward, but I'm going to run through them with some examples. So there are trends, there are lead tables, comparisons, relationships to one thing cause another thing, is something correlated with something. And I think a really good one is surprising or counterintuitive data, because it can, that can sometimes catch people's attention. So I think whenever you're looking at data, I think you're thinking about you know, the, the stories you want to tell and what are the five core narratives that you can tell with your story. Uh, and so I'll just run through examples of these, and then what Alex is going to do is take you through in a more practical way how you can actually collect data, how you can analyze data, and some tips around doing it. So I'm just going to give you a few examples here. So let's start with trends. Trends are sort of the easiest. You can just have a line chart and we can see a trend. But trends tell stories, which is what's interesting about them, and it's finding the story to tell. So here we're looking at 10-year bond yields, the equivalent of interest rates, and we can see that for 30 years, as central banks have tried to encourage the economy to grow, they've cut interest rates, and they've cut interest rates <laughs> to encourage our economies to grow. Um, and the interesting thing now is that interest rates are almost at zero. In fact, in Germany, as you can see on this chart, they're below zero. And I think Germany, Japan, Switzerland, they all have negative interest rates. So you're actually charged for savings. It's quite unusual. So this is telling a story of, OK, central banks have cut and cut interest rates. What happens now? So it's, it raises an interesting story. So it's just a simple chart. Uh, something is falling. Um, you can also look at things growing. This comes from a blog post that I wrote a couple of weeks ago, um, which is slightly controversial with some people, basically just saying there's going to be more content out there. So our job as content marketers is going to get harder because there's more content for us to compete with. And I'm not saying that's a good thing. It may not be a good thing, but it's just the reality. So I can show trends here, the number of pages indexed by Google. So in 2008, they'd indexed a trillion pages. By 2014, they'd indexed uh, 30 trillion pages, and in that last year, they actually increased by 8 trillion pages in a year, so it's actually getting bigger and growing. Um, and the, the chart below just shows the number of posts published each month on WordPress, um, and last month, there were over 80 million posts published, and that's just on WordPress, and obviously, there are lots and lots of other sites, so you can use charts like this just to show that things are growing. So something falling, something growing, there's a story there. There's also a story, potentially, if the trend is flat. So if you do your research and you find, well, I've got a flat trend, that might still be a story. So here we've got a, a headline, Twitter fails to grow active users. The trend is actually quite flat from 2015 onwards, um, but that's a story because Twitter, we know in terms of the investment terms, et cetera, needs to grow active users. Um, so that becomes a story in its own right. So trends up, down, even flat, they can all be a story for you. The second narrative I think you can look at is comparisons. So when you're comparing at least two or more uh, more items, you can look at the data uh, in terms of what works. Here's an example from the New York Times, which is disparity in lifespans of rich and poor. Um, and they use a chart. They use a number of charts. I just picked out one here. And it's an interesting chart. It basically shows for the, you know, the richest 50% of women at the age of 50, their lifespans are increasing. Interestingly, for women in the lowest 50%, and particularly the poorest 10%, their lifespans are actually declining. So the gap in terms of lifespan between rich and poor in America is getting bigger, it's getting wider. So they have a story there. So you can do comparisons. There are lots of comparisons that you can do. A lot of you will be familiar with this chart, I'm sure. This is the latest US presidential election. It's all the opinion polls. I quite like it that it, it pinpoints everyone as dots, and it then shows you um, the trend lines. So we can see in some ways the story of the election just through these trend lines. Um, so we'll see these things a lot in terms of comparisons. Um, just a, another final one, looking at comparisons. 
yeah, I thought this is just interesting. We can see a huge rise in the consumption of bottled water per capita, um, and actually since 2000, a decline in soda and bottled water now beginning to overtake soda. So comparisons are really good for telling that story, and that story might be about uh, people who are more health conscious, etc. But it's finding the story inside your data, um, and so comparisons are a good way of doing that. Rank order tables, third one. Um, Everyone likes to see league tables, not just in sports. Um, this particular one is from Inc, and this is a league table showing the value of brands. So just showing just, just how powerful and strong uh, Apple's brand value is. It's not just number one, its brand value is, is almost twice Google's and uh, more than twice uh, Microsoft's, for example. So rank order tables are a good way. You may have data which can put things into tables to show people uh, who's leading, who's at the bottom of the table, and that creates a story. Um, I did a simple piece of analysis in BuzzSumo, as you may know if you do a search, we categorize each article into a topic. So I looked at all the articles that we'd classified about content marketing, and I saw which sites had the most shares of articles about content marketing. Um, and so this was, I think, just for a one-year period. But um, and. The, you can see the Content Marketing Institute was actually top for specifically for content marketing articles. HubSpot was bigger overall, um, but it just shows you four top sites for content marketing articles. Um, so you can use these types of lead tables. The other thing you can do is you can actually do lead table comparisons uh, as well. So you can take a lead table and a comparison and put those both into your story. So again, this is something from our own research. <clears throat> we looked at the top trigrams on Twitter and Facebook, and a trigram is simply a three-word phrase. So 10 pictures that, five signs your, the X stands for a number, or the science of the case for. And so these are simply two league tables. It shows the trigrams that got the most likes and shares on Facebook on the left, and the trigrams that got the most shares on Twitter on the right. And I was interested to see also a comparison. Would, would they be the same? And actually they're not. So the, the trigrams that work on Twitter and not necessarily the same as those that work on Facebook. And so that's sort of interesting. So you can do rank order tables, but you can also do comparisons within that. A really big one, and you have to do quite a lot of analysis to do this, is to, to look at relationships, and particularly looking at correlations and causation. And a correlation, just because something correlates doesn't mean it causes it. You need to do further investigation. This chart is actually a classic chart for statisticians. It comes from the film Moneyball, if anyone of you have seen the film Moneyball. Um, basically, I'm not a big baseball fan, but in the past, people looked at things like batting averages, number of home runs, to look at how good a player was and whether it would help a side win. And when they did all the statistical analysis, what they found was this figure, this, this OPS differential. OPS, I won't go into the details, I'll put the description there for you, but OPS is basically it's about getting on base and the number of bases that you make. Actually, the strongest correlation with winning were with teams that had players with a, with a high OPS and actually changed the way they recruit players and uh, into what they pay them as well in terms of um, OPS. So that was a really classic one. And if you can find a strong correlation, that would have a correlation of almost one. The correlations, as you probably know, run from plus one to a, a negative correlation, which is negative one. And a correlation of zero means there is no correlation. Great if you can find a correlation, but you can still have a story if there is no correlation in your data. Um, and you can use tools like R, which you may come onto a statistical package, or other tools to look at correlations. There are also lots of online tools where you can put two columns of data in. They'll calculate the correlations for you. Um, but here's one where there was no correlation. So this is from the Washington Post. Someone thought there would be a relationship between state gun laws and homicide rates. And actually, when they pulled all the data in, they couldn't find any correlations. There was no correlation between the two. So that became a story in its own right, the fact that there wasn't a correlation as opposed to the fact there was one. And we found a similar thing. We, the post I did for Moz that time, I specifically did some work with Rand Fishkin saying, do we think posts that get shares also get links? And I think we thought they probably did. So we thought that a post that gets lots of shares will also get lots of links. So we would expect a positive correlation. But actually, we found absolutely no correlation. We found no correlation at all between shares and referring domain links, or any form of links, actually. Um, the correlation from the sample that we took, which was a million posts, was actually virtually zero. So it wasn't close to one. It wasn't close to negative one. It was just close to zero. There was no correlation. And that implies that people share and link to content for different reasons. And I think that's true. So you can find viral quizzes, get lots of shares, 
but really not that many links. So not finding a relationship can also be a story, and this article became a story. Um, the final one is, and I really like this, is about surprising data. You could argue the shares and links were surprising in some ways. It's just trying to find data which actually might be counterintuitive, people might not expect. Now, this may not be a good example. Some of you may know this and think that's not surprising at all. But if you look at the imprisonment rates for countries in the OECD, the US imprisons more people per head of population than anybody else. And not only does it imprison more people per head of population than anybody else, it does so significantly more, like three times more um, than other countries. And so that becomes a story that's surprising. And then you can investigate why. And I did do a bit of investigating as to why. And it looks as if it comes down to um, really a change in the legislation, a change in policy around 1980, and I think that was a three strikes policy, etc. But as a consequence of that, uh, the number of incarcerated Americans rose dramatically and is still rising. So as an introduction, my view is when you're going to write data-driven stories, think about those five core narratives and think about those that will work for you in your story. And sometimes not finding a correlation, not finding a growing trend can be stories in their own right. So I now just pass over to, to Alex to take you through some practicalities of how you can do things. Let's just Thank you very find. much, Steve, for sharing uh, some really exciting stories and how you can find those stories in data. But uh, I hope that it's going to streamline your creativity process. And so I'll be on a really practical side right now. So I'll show how exactly you can um, deliver those data-driven stories. Uh, and before that, uh, I've noticed that even top digital marketing blogs, they rarely really write data-driven stories. And look at this. That's a HubSpot top content. So um, I took this data from Basuma, so you can go there and see it. That's uh, the top content. Um, for the last uh, six months. As, as you can see, I briefly classified them, as you can see, little list guides, a bit of how-tos. So moving further, here is a pro blogger example. As, uh, as you can see, it's like uh, the majority of pieces, they are, they are classified as how-tos, and they have a bit of tips. And so, for instance, here is a convince and convert um, top content as well. So they have predictions, how tos, and they have so they are closer than others to data-driven uh, stories because uh, they've published the results of research and trying to connect the dots. So you know, like kind of explanation. But uh, so the question is. Why don't they do that? They know how to do that. They have a big audience. They they should have resources. Well, you know, the answer is pretty obvious. It takes more effort. It takes more effort from us to deliver those kind of stories. And that's very true. And so, but why you should do that? So there's a question, I think. So first of all, uh, that's what I've learned from my experience because, well, I try to, first, like for my personal branding, uh, I try to write, first of all, data-driven stories. You are going to stand out. Believe me, that's, that's the right way to stand out in the digital marketing industry and believe in, in any other industry as well because when we deliver campaigns for our clients, that's um, based on data-driven approach when we crunch numbers, try to find coloration trends, compare something, that's a really, really good piece that deserves to, to receive a, a good number of referring domains that um, can be easily pitched to journalists. So that's a way of a standout even if you don't have uh, the big name and you don't have recognition in your industry. The second reason is publicity. As I've already mentioned, it's uh, about improving your image, uh, build your name, and it's about pitching to top news portals. So w whatever a classical PR campaign should have. So that's a really good starting point. And so what I'm going to do today, today I'll tell you what works in terms of data-driven content, how to collect data, and how to structure a content so that it has the most possible impact. So. 
uh, here is a really great example of search ranking factors uh, that was delivered by Moss. And as you can see, that's a data-driven uh, piece, and um, it has um, almost, well, you know, really close to 150 referring domains. And so, as you can see, I, calculate, I calculated the average, the average number of referring domains per post on Moss blog. And so, as you can see, it's nearly two times more. There's a one example. It's uh, well, you know, I also contribute to Moss Block, and um, well, you know, my authority and my level. So let's say my level of authority and recognition. How how I recognizable in terms of a brand as, as, as by myself. Uh, it's not really um, relatively the same as Rand Fishkin or Riley Kim. However, uh, just because of that, that type of content, um, I, I, I was able, you know, to be closer to those guys in terms of uh, social shares and so as you can see. Uh, so, but what really works? How you can structure your content so it's going to be presented in the most powerful way. So what I've noticed that a really powerful hypothesis is based on well-known hot news. That's, you know, how you can empower it. And so, you know, by choosing the right topic, you'll ensure the success of your whole campaign. And I'll show you uh, the concrete approaches to make it really easy and straightforward. And one of them, that's about well-known trends, uh, using well-known trends uh, and hot news. So, but where can you learn about industry trends? That's a couple of ideas in order to simplify the process. So, first of all, Quora. I, I, I'm certain that everyone heard about Quora. Some of us um, is using it on a regular basis, uh, uh, is using it time to time at least. And so you can find uh, well known trends of Quora. So those topics that are trending uh, for a quite long time, that's the right topics. The same on Reddit. So you go on Reddit and you can see like subreddits over there by any topic. So here is an example about travel industry. And you get it. And the last one, what I think is also quite useful, uh, that's industry communities. Here is um, a screenshot of inbound.org top stories. Uh, and the same you can go to, well, you know, you can find an industry. Uh, so. Uh, uh, a particular community in your industry, and so go there and uh, filter out uh, the top stories where they're going to be based on social shares. That's uh, what you can do with the help of BuzzSumo, or well, you know, you can go if you're interested about uh, backlinks. Uh, you can go to Majestic or Ahrefs as well. So they have also quite uh, useful um, tools in order to see the top content based on this. And the last one approach that I think also quite powerful and actionable, that's what you can do in Basuma directly. So if you have an idea, like, you know, you wanted to discover a particular um, content uh, by, by keyword or by search term, so what you can do here, you can just put it uh, in Basuma and see the most viral content for a specific period of time. That's about uh, well-known trends, and so what's? Uh, but what about hot news? It might be really uh, well. It might be not so straightforward when you don't know where to search. But if you know how to do that, then you can do it in a few minutes. So what I would recommend here. So first of all, Google Trends. I know it has some limited categories, but if you if your business um, uh, within those lists. Uh, then it's really easy to go there first of all because they they show the most um, uh, well you know what is trending right now in terms of uh, uh, in use uh, in your uh, business category. 
but in case, uh, um, so you're not lucky enough to be in the list of those categories in Google Trends, what you can do, uh, uh, what you can do, you can go to similar web and they have industry analysis features called and they have uh, more than 200 different categories. You can go there, select the right category that's relevant to your business or to your client's business and just see the top websites and so, well, you know, that normally top websites among top websites you'll find uh, news uh News, com news and communities, um, news websites and communities, and that's uh, uh, well, you know, the sites that you are that you you are going to look for. So uh, that's a couple of ways how you can do it, and so what I believe uh, those approaches they are going to help you build uh, a really powerful hypothesis, and that might look here as an example. So well, you know. Um, so, for instance, it might be without backlinks, you can't run Google. Well, sounds not bad, but uh, so what about, you know, figuring out whether it's true or false? Because what you need to do, you need to confirm it or not confirm it. So, basically, so what I was talking about, uh, about that was talking to Steve as well. So, you need to find the coloration, a trend here or whatever it is. And so I think, uh, so the part about collecting and analyzing uh, data, that might be a really uh, hard one. And so I want to share with you how to collect powerful data, analyze a big data sets and increase your publicity uh, through involving experts and partners because that's what we found out is really a, 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 the most effective way of doing that. So, oops, okay. So here, uh, talking about collecting stats, I want to back a bit to traditional marketing here. And so, if you if you ever um, was touching uh, traditional marketing, so you should know that uh, there is like you know two main approaches, uh, two two main options of collecting stats: uh, primary data and, and secondary data. And so, well, uh, in primary data, you're going to use uh, a couple of approaches, so uh, like surveys and interviews. And um, uh, here's um, a bunch of tools that uh, 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 that we use to speed up uh, the process. Uh, of collecting the data. So the first one option when you want to distribute um, uh, a survey uh, by yourself. So well, but um, the people who uh, do that on regular basis, they know that uh, that people hate surveys. Being honest, and nobody wants uh, fill out surveys. Uh, so. But type form, that's a way of making your surveys um, entertaining. So get more responses because a type form makes your surveys not boring. So that's why uh, I want to recommend this tool. And it's engaging, it's colorful, so it has some moving. Um, so I mean, like some, something like you, you can set up some kind of movements over there. So it, it's really entertaining. And so people will love to participate in your surveys. Um, and the second option when you uh, don't want to uh, spend your time and resources on uh, distributing uh, a survey and you just want to uh, come somewhere, just uh, put a survey and so uh, uh, it's going to be somehow distributed. For, for sure, uh, within a relevant audience which you are going to set up by yourself. And here is uh, um, another one solution for you, Paul Fish, it's called Paul Fish. And so uh, they, they, they allow you to um, collect uh, answers uh, for a relatively small price. And so I, I think they're, they're fairly good. So that's why I want to share them with you. And so by, by, by using Type Farm and Polfish, it, it helps to save your time and uh, not to waste it, let's say. So um, here is like, you know, a couple of ideas. 
And so what about secondary data? What is it? Uh, it's, um, that's the type of information that already exists in the web. And being honest, I, I, I prefer more to work with this type of data. And so uh, that's uh, what uh, Steve has all dimensions as well. That's what you can build. Uh, so if you are a uh, so if you write for digital marketing, for instance, uh, you can go to Basuma and um, uh, so like collect interesting insights with the help of this tool as well. But looking at some kind of colorations, like uh, how different um, blocks uh, uh, performing in terms of uh, social shares, let's say. Um, but sometimes it might be more complicated, and that's what I want to touch here. So, um, so first of all, uh, statista.com. This is a website where you can find various, various uh, researchers about. Um, well, you know, they are touching the majority of printers that I know, and so they have a lot of different uh, researches about past current trends, and that's uh, that. That might be a starting point here. So, in order to uh, speed up uh, your creativity process, and in order to have some starting point, uh, but the truth is that uh, well, in majority of cases, you can't do that without a developer. So unfortunately, well, you know, I, I'm not like a huge fan of working with developers because, you know, sometimes it happens. It, it turns out to be a disaster. But uh, well, that's what you need if you want to build a really uh, interesting insights because you need to collect uh, a huge number of. Um, different researchers and somehow uh, work with them. So that's why you might need to crawl internet, different websites. So uh, in that case, if you don't have an internal developer, you can get a low cost uh, by, uh, so you can get a developer on Upwork and so they, they, they don't ask a lot. So basically that will be a low cost uh, uh, option. Uh, so uh, and um, so the thing that when you have all those data, sometimes it's really massive uh, data sets, and it's hard to work with them in Excel and in spreadsheets. Or you can work with them, but it requires additional uh, developers' resources or whatever it is. So you can take a look at those tools. Uh, so thanks to Steve because um, I've. Actually, I've updated my slides with those tools because uh, he was kind enough to share them. And I think they're really good, so um, basically I want to refer to them in my slides. Uh, so you can uh, work with IBM or, or optionally the Air Projects for Statistical Computing. That's another one too. And they have also a desktop version and I believe they should have a cloud one. Might, might have, actually. And so that's another one option for you. So, um, so from my side, what I do when I have a lot of data, uh, I would recommend you to take a look at BI um, uh, Excel, something like it's something like application where you can also visualize data. And normally uh, I use them, but that uh, that's, uh, requires a bit of coding, so you need to know at least um, you need to have at least better knowledge. Uh, but what about so like you know you have data, um, but it's going to increase your publicity. How you can save your time at that step uh, and for sure uh, gain publicity by saving your money and time. Here is a couple of hacks that we've um, somehow involved in my company, and that's what uh, I recommend you to to give a try. So first of all, you can involve. That's a really, you know, a relatively um, cheap way to do uh, to, to to get publicity because what you do, you can optionally you can ask for a quote, and so you are going to feature uh, an expert on a quote in your content, and that's um, a fairly good one way. Or if you have a bit more resources, what you can do, what 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 we do sometimes, we do a research, so we crunch numbers, and then we do a survey for. Um, for a particular group of experts, and we ask their opinion, and then we compare. So we have like you know statistical data and then experts' opinion, and that's really interesting because sometimes you can find a really controversial kind of you know correlations over there. 
And so the second option here is go to third party companies, so basically try to gain partners. So I would say here uh, for sure partnerships is the way to streamline data collection. And so here is a couple of steps how you, well, you know, in general you need to proceed. Um, Proceeded. So first of all, you need to connect with the company that has the data. So be sure that you are connecting the right companies. Um, so in my case, uh, um, uh, I work a lot, you know, with companies like SimilarRep and Ahrefs, and also thanks uh, a lot to Batsuman. Sometimes <laughs> I ask to Stevie um, also, well, uh, ask Stevie uh, about like some kind of particular data. And also, so the next step here, like, you know, when you outreach those companies, you need to show value of publicity. So basically you need to uh, tell them where you're going to publish your content or how you're going to outreach. So they, 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 they so you need to make um, some kind of, you need to sell your idea. Uh, so that's kind of a process. And then you exchange publicity for data. So that's pretty simple. Uh, but um, so, uh, <laughs> It might sound too good. It might sound too good to be true, and th th yeah, for sure it has some downside, and that's what we figure out so far. So first of all, you don't control the process, and that's what I hate mostly because it, it um, might take uh, ages. Let's say, so starting from a couple of months and ending up, I don't know, with something like. Uh, one year, whatever it is. So yeah, it happens. Uh, also, you will likely invest more than your partner. Yeah, it, it, it's quite upsetting and might be quite depressing, but it's true. And so you should keep in mind that your partner have other priorities, and so you're not going to be prioritized as, a, as, as the top one. So <clears throat> keeping in mind those downsides, uh, still partnerships, uh, they work pretty good, and I recommend to my clients do that, uh, especially if they are not uh, so well-known companies, because it helps. And um, so here is it's like when you have a data, it's time to reformulate uh, your statement, your thesis. And here is like what you can do. So for instance, if you remember that was about backlink, so what you can do, uh, if you know exactly what's going on, you can say like 99% of websites uh, on the first page of Google have more than 1,000 um, um, backlinks. So that will be a good one, uh, and so it has data, so you know what's going on and you show it. And after you, you, you are going to reformulate your uh, thesis, your statement, uh, it's time to structure your content. So what you need, uh, so what I'm going to tell you here, that, uh, so at this stage, uh, you have the data and you are ready to turn it um, into an actionable piece. And so I'll show you how you can really easily save your time and effort in writing your future article by checking your style and structuring your content for the specific place you plan to publish it. Yes, at this stage, you, it's really important to have a place. Or um, otherwise, you're going to rewrite. So, like, unfortunately, um, it happens with everyone who's, like, you know, like writing in general and then trying to adjust it to a particular block, especially if we talk about um, top blocks. Uh, but before that, uh, well, yeah, I still have a couple of minutes, so uh, let's do that. Uh, I want to do a really short quiz. So here is, um, I'll, I'll, I'll show you a couple of slides, and you need to select uh, A or B on each slide. You will, ha you will see two statements, and you need to select the most powerful uh, statement from your point of view on each slide. So um, let's try it. So please uh, also please write your answer in the chat box so I'm going to take a look at that so we can just, you know, uh, see the results. So first of all here you can see like uh, two statements. So the first one about, um, so 50% of companies that use social media don't know how to measure their effectiveness. That's the first one. The second one, 50% of companies increased their budgets on social media in 2016. So um, just please uh, write down your answer and I'm going to move to the next slide. So 
basically, uh, here are the next one. 70% of marketers lack a consistent or integrated approach to their work. Uh, and here is the second one, B. 70% uh, of marketers have a content strategy. And so that will be the last one slide. 45% uh, of marketers will increase their content marketing budget in 2016. And the second one, B. 45% uh, of marketers don't have a documented content marketing strategy. So, so I believe I don't see answers or whether no one will was <laughs> brave enough to share. But, so in order to summarize my idea, because I think that was like a really interesting examples. Um, yeah, there's a lot. Actually, there are lots. I would say they're fairly evenly split between A's and B's. <laughs> uh, A and B. So yeah. they're like, you know, okay. But I don't see them. That is I'm really strange. Just, just me, it's just in the questions. They're in the questions panel, not in the chat room. Ah, but, so. in the questions. Okay, <laughs> let me take a look because I was like, you know, curious. <laughs> no, I don't see questions as well. People from probably would ask for it. They, they seem fairly evenly split. Maybe more A's. Uh, more A's. Okay. Maybe more gotcha. uh, Okay. Uh, sorry, I'll move back. So, guys, uh, here is a, a thing that, in reality, uh, people, they prefer... Oh, I'm sorry, I should move... Uh, yeah. So, people prefer to select, to, 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 to see negative stories. Or it's better to say tend to because, like, you know, preferring it's just something like a personal preference. So, uh, but why? So the question is why? Uh, so those two nice gentlemen, they conducted a research, an eye tracking research. And so the results of those research, they were quite um, depressing because people they 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 so they, they were like you know um, they put uh, their audience in front of computers and they were showing them uh, different articles and they were picking up uh, mostly negative stories. So we want to hear, let's say, we we, we want to hear negative uh, stories and we are reacting uh, better on negative stories, just because that's the way our brain, I think, works. So that's why, uh, so the result of this study as well prove that people tend to select negative news. But how we can uh, take advantage from this knowledge? So what you can do with your hypothesis after you have a data and after, so yeah, after you, you have everything. So you can tweak it and make it negative. So believe me, uh, so based on my experience, people will react uh, much, well, uh, a lot more on negative stories. Uh, so that's, you know, about framing it. And so I really recommend to use uh, this kind of a hack. And so uh, just I have just two slides more. And um, so I would say like a couple of words about uh, checking your style. Here I would say what is really important here to be uh, to be sure that you are writing in the style of a blog, and so be sure that you use the right style. So whether it's academic or informal, so you need to select the one and follow it. For instance, here is an example just to, to clarify this statement. Um, most blog it, it it's more has informal style, but for instance, e consultancy when they publish um, that's uh, another one uh, popular digital marketing. Um, community. Uh, when they publish, they, they publish their resources, it's more in academic style. The same about entertainment, whether you need to add jokes or you need to be dry and just like put together the facts. Whether it should be short or long. Here are what I use, I use Bassuma. So what you need to do in order not to just, you know, waste your time on calculating words. You just need to go to Bassum and use content analysis feature and you just put a, a particular URL there and see the length of content, really useful, really handy, um, recommended to each and every. Uh, and so the last one about structure. So, well, I believe to any content you need to use title and subtitles. So, but the question about intro, how it 
that's needed to be formulated that's also you know in terms of um, style of a block and how they prefer to do it also whether they love lists or not doesn't love lists and the last one what you should definitely do for any kind of a blocks uh, because that's going to make your research really solid so you need to visualize your insights uh, so you need to well what I prefer here to hire designer if you don't have it and so here you can use app work one more time and so for one hundred dollars uh, I hire really good designers normally and so they deliver an eye-catching uh, images uh, and, and visuals that uh, we can share also on social media as well as uh, they are presented in content and helps people uh, stick with the content uh, with, with that particular content and stay more and reading it so, uh, in order to sum up everything, uh, I want to say that um, I believe now you know how to find what works, collect, analyze the data in the best way, structure your content, so that even the top blocks want you and readers love you. And uh, just curious, like, you know, um, any well what I believe any business is specific and so more specific for your company uh, situation I want to give away a free hour one hour of consulting so I would love to do that uh, to the first of these people who are going to email me so I really want to work with you guys and hope to see your emails um, and so thank you very much for your time and so I believe it's time for questions and, yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thank you. Right. Thanks, Alex. That's great. No, it's really good. Thank you. So, I hope some good ideas there for people to follow. I think we've gone through most of the questions as people have asked them uh, today, but because people have been asking about tools for um, had tools to help them uh, create charts, etc. Also, types of charts to use, and I think that often depends on the story you're telling. Obviously, if it's a trend, then, then you know bar charts, line graphs tend to work. For example, if it's proportion of people who use certain networks, then you can still use a pie chart. I know someone was saying they dislike a pie charts, and uh, it can be hard to interpret uh, those things. Um, but I, I think for me, coming back, is it's it doesn't. I think. I personally like to do original research because I think it's, it's new and interesting mm -hmm. for people, but it doesn't have to be. Um, you can you can see what research other people are publishing and you can quickly uh, write stories around that or take two or three related pieces of research and give your perspective on it. It is hard work to do the research and the data. I think it's worth it if you have your own original piece, but you can write data-driven posts just by looking on sites like Pew Research is always a good one. PewResearch.org is a good sort of site. There are lots of good sites there, 538, etc., um, who who write lots of data-driven um, content um, that you can then you know just pick surveys from different places and put your perspective on them. Or you can do original research. It's not always as hard as you think. I mean, if you use Persimmon, for example, you can export data. So you could see the top posts on fly fishing. You can export 10,000 rows of that data, take those 10,000 headlines, push them into a text analyzer tool, and easily look at what are the top trigrams for fly fishing posts, for example. Some simple things, or you can analyze the data there. So um, there are lots of other tools as well. Obviously, I'm just mentioning as we, we use it. But you can just take data from that um, and then do your own analysis, and that creates something which is insightful because it's your own content. So I would play with both doing primary research, but also if you haven't got the time to do primary research, and the downside is you can research for weeks and not find anything that interesting, as I find sometimes. Um, but you, you can also say so you can sort of news jack, take two or three recent uh, surveys on a particular topic and write your perspective on it, or, or write a different chart. I find that people news chat my posts interesting now I write a long blog post and the next day I see someone's developed an infographic based on the data I've talked about and they've done a much better visual job than I have and actually got quite a lot of shares on it so um, so don't don't feel ashamed of doing that either so I think there are lots of ways um, someone saying towards video content marketing um, are we moving towards video content marketing um, I don't know if Alex you have a view on that I think generally there's a lot more video out there but video can also still show trends you can show nice building trends over time so the fact it's video I don't think takes away from the fact it could be original research particularly um, 
I don't know if you have any thoughts on video content, Alex? Um, well, you know, uh, we don't work a lot with the video, actually. That's what um, I was, like, you know, considering of doing. But what I think video, they more, like, you know, works better for some, like, short how-tos. Because uh, mm, that's what I think about it, but it's, like, kind of, you know, you need to test it before, like, making any kind of, you know, like, kind of um, final statements, let's say. But that's my assumption here. And so, you know, uh, but if you can visualize it, so I think it's like, you know, if you just um, stand nearby whiteboard, for instance, or, and just talk about data-driven content, that might be a bit boring. But if you can somehow, like, uh, make it entertaining, visualize it, I mean, like, in terms of, like, you know, all those uh, video tweaks, um, then it might work, but uh, I yeah. guess it, it requires more work, yeah. more and additional so work. Yeah, so it isn't primary research too expensive for small shops. I don't think it is necessarily. Um, if you use some, like surveys can be quite quick to do. I mean, they can take a lot of time as well, but you can survey a specific audience. So if you have a newsletter and you've got an audience, you can invite them to take part in a survey. And you might give them some small reward or not for that. Or you can use the sites like um, Alex recommended where you can write the survey and they'll send it to target groups of your audience. Um, I was surprised my... I know my son did a research project university and he sent out just a survey monkey survey and got quite a lot of feedback and that becomes original research or say you can use lots of tools like the BuzzSumo to say you know what was the most shared content on Twitter uh, this month how did it compare to the most shared content on Twitter last month for particular topics what's the trend what's how's it changing so it doesn't always have to take tons of time to do it and I, I have to say a lot of the tools are really good these days you know, if you if you do pull a lot of data say you pull 10,000 rows of data from our tool you can put it into something like uh, IBM Watson which will identify trends for you or tools like R the stats package will really do correlations and things very fast for you, you just put in the data and then you say right correlate <laughs> correlate this this item and that item so the tools are getting much much better to, to enable you to come up with with interesting insights so yes it can take quite a lot of time but there are, there are lots of ways to do some, I think, relatively low-cost um, primary research. Um, so, okay. Um, there's other ones. So someone asked about the source of the research. I mean, there are lots of sites that publish research content, but Pew Research, uh, PEW Research, does quite a lot, uh, a lot of these um, sorts of things, um, as does you know, 538, and there's, there are quite a lot of them. Maybe we should put a list together for that. Um, Okay, um, so what tool should a research consultant working with the client strategy, um, what tool should a research consultant, oh yeah, what, what tool should you pitch to a client as part of a team? I think it depends on the research that you're doing, um, but typically I think you would use survey tools. If you're going to do a survey, then you'd pitch certain survey tools, including tools where people choose the respondents for you. Um, if you're doing statistical analysis, you've got a big data set with numbers in, then actually using something like IBM Watson or, or R or other statistical tools um, would be useful for that sort of research. Um, so it, it partly depends, I think, on the research that you're doing. Okay, um, outlist of published uh, data-driven stories. Um, I think everybody's interested in new data stories, really. So often you can pitch ideas, and I think that's what uh, Alex was covering earlier. You can pitch ideas to larger publications, etc., for pieces of research, um, and that's really where we started at Sumo. So, you know, we just thought we have this data. Wouldn't it be great to get a post on Moz? You know, we didn't know Moz very well, so we really just you know, I managed to, to, to get hold of Rand, who's very busy, and pitched the idea of saying, wouldn't this be a really good piece of research? You provide us with the link data, we'll provide you with the share data, we'll do the analysis. So so we pitch we pitch a lot to people saying, wouldn't it be interesting if we do a joint piece of research? Um, and so the, the, the techniques that Alex outlined really sort of works for us. But I think loads of people are really interested in, you know, hard data original research. There are so many posts out there five ways to improve your landing page, which really aren't that valuable to people, and there are just tons and tons of them. Once you've got original research, original data, people are much more interested, I think. So I think people may be more likely to take a guest post blog or to even work jointly with you on a piece of research if you come up with a good pitch. 
I'm very conscious that we're we've at the end of we we said we only do 40 or so minutes and we're now almost up to the hour. So I just wanted to say thank you very much to to Alex for, for the presentation. Thank you everyone for uh, attending today. If you have any questions, you've got Alex's details there. My email is just steve at buzzsumo.com. You can just mail me or my colleague Susan at buzzsumo.com, who's been uh, studiously organizing and keeping, <laughs> keeping the questions answered today. Uh, and we'll try our best to, to answer to you. But you'll also get a, a copy of the slides and of the recording uh, in a couple of days. But thank you very much, everyone, for your time.